How is this war going so far? You have to understand that they actually pretend to think they are fighting the U.S. and Ukraine, right? They are, that's a Jewish Nazi you're talking about. Yeah, that's only, yeah. all pretty degraded by yeah. their life in Russia. The system Putin constructed is degraded human beings. Like really, really bad, really brutal, right? I mean, it, it, there's enough casualties here already. We don't need people killed who are not ready for it. The general mood is that you leave the last bullet for yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome again to the Black Side Show. Today, um, it's a very important segment. We are still continuing our uh, fighting against the disinformation in the Ukraine. And uh, today is very, very important uh, segment. We have the owner here to um, have someone who's extremely important in the Ukrainian government. We have Mr. Pavlo Kukta, who is actually the former Minister of Economy, uh, Economy in the Ukraine. Uh, also, um, he's an advisor to President Zelensky. He was part of President Zelensky um, government. And the reason why we brought him today, uh, right live from Kiev, right from the front lines, as you can see, he's in his military uniform fighting for his country. The reason we brought back somebody at that caliber is because we want the American people to understand the struggles, the disinformation that's being pushed by the Russian, the Russian uh, KBG within our country and trying to basically get to the bottom line of the truth. Um, sometimes we have to be careful about the decisions we make in our life. We have to be very unbiased, and we have to really get the information from the people that are there on the ground and not judge somebody based on what we hear in the news or what we hear anywhere else. So today, I brought Mr. Pablo Kukta right from the front lines in Kiev, uh, someone who's working in the government at a level as a minister of economy, understands everything. Uh, Mr. Pablo, thank you so much for coming on our show. It's really honor having you with us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And, and so we, I want to start with uh, so many things that I want to start with. Um, but you have seen what's happening in the United States, which I'm sure that you have seen what's happening in the United States in the last uh, month in regarding the Ukraine, that half of the American people are undecided uh, what to believe anymore. There was a lot of claims about the Ukraine um, that came out after the first week of, uh, of the war in the Ukraine. Um, so many things going on that the, the average American is undecided, is confused, doesn't know what to believe anymore because there's so many sources of information that are being shoved right on their face. Um, today I also have um, average American citizen, a musician, my friend Tom Hutchinson here with us on the show today. And um, he is somebody that is that American citizen that doesn't have this access to information, sees what's in the news and doesn't, doesn't have the access to resources or trying to understand what the truth is. So tell us, how are things going on the Ukraine so far? How is this war going so far? Well, I mean, I have to start with the fact that this is the largest war Europe has seen since World War II. So this is, this is big. This is a really, really big, large-scale war. Uh, it, it was, mm, I'd say, surprising how it developed, right? Because for years, Russia pretended that it was a like, first-rate military power capable of crushing anything around it, that it was somehow uh, capable of standing up to the U.S. military, for example. Right? That was essentially their pretense. Essentially, what, whatever they're doing, they're pretending that they can stand up to the Americans. That's kind of uh, their way of thinking for the last 20 years. And they turned out to be a paper tiger, right? So we've all seen how it worked out. And this supposedly first-rate army uh, essentially got its ass kicked near Kiev. And now it's kind of stuck fighting along the southern and eastern. Well, I would, I would love to say border of Ukraine, but it's not border there. Inside the country, they've occupied certain territories along the border. Uh, but, of course, they failed miserably in their ambition to take and swallow uh, the whole country. If I may add, just to, you know, to, to give a bit of a personal touch, I am actually half American, so my stepdad is American. My mom and him, nice. they reside right now. Uh, by the way, not on the coast, but right there in the middle, in the Midwest, in Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> so, you know, I've been there. Being a lot of time in what people call real America. 
right? So I, so I, I don't, you, you, I don't you're think. You're familiar yeah, yes. with how the American people think. You familiar Look, with? Look, I'm, I'm, I'm quite familiar, um, familiar with the U.S. I had a green card. I've year, yeah. I've spent years in the states. So yeah, yeah and I mean, I've, I'm quite. Um, uh, sometimes I'm actually more comfortable around Americans than <laughs> around yeah. my fellow Ukrainians. Anybody so, else? And yeah. it, so, what, what are you seeing on the ground on the Ukraine on a daily basis? What's happening right now? Like, what do you see every single day? Uh, see- look, I mean, uh, essentially, essentially, I'm, I can only talk, you know, a, a first-hand experience about the front yeah. line in the south, right? Maybe the Donbass, which is the eastern region where supposedly the action is taking place right now, though it's kind of everywhere. Maybe it's a bit different. So, in the south. Uh, in the start of the war, uh, this was the most successful area of Russian advance. They managed to take one region of Ukraine, the Kherson region, and one major town, Kherson, one major administrative center. They took it without, more or less without a fight. So Ukrainian units had to retreat under the barrage of missiles and aircraft. Uh, then the Russians were stopped further north, but they managed to secure that town. And now there is fighting uh, kind of like, 20, 30, 40 kilometers from this town. This is where the front line is coming and where this is where uh, I was until very recently. Uh, it's essentially a more or less stable front line. Uh, mostly it's an artillery combat. So you come out close uh, to the front line, you get shot at by, by something. Right? So I've been in some pretty nasty situations there. Uh, mostly it's uh, like that. Sometimes some villages changing hands. Essentially everything along this yeah. front line is destroyed. So if you be yeah. in those villages, it's like every house is wiped out and you're only looking for a cellar to hide somewhere from the artillery so, falling so you, on you. Uh, one thing I wanted to get your attention that uh, here in America, we started seeing two different stories about like individuals who are being bombed in hospitals, the uh, crimes <laughs> that are being committed by the Russians. And we started seeing two sides of the stories. We started seeing uh, actual civilians um, getting bombed in hospitals, civilians getting hit. And at the other side of the media started uh, saying that the Ukrainians are staging these things, right? They're staging these uh, scenes that, that this is not happening. This is all uh, Ukrainians are staging this. This is all PSYOP. And this basically confused the average American into what to believe anymore. They didn't know where, which side to take on because... We do have influencers in this country. We have media. We have very powerful uh, reporters that are pushing certain agenda. So, what do you? What would you? How would you explain all this? All this happening here in the United States, where um, we hear this is a staged, and then we hear this is not staged. This is real. They're really bombing civilians. They're killing people. And uh, I notice myself as someone who's been experienced in psyop and psychological warfare my whole life. I noticed that people who looked very clean in the territories that where the Russians were taken over were welcoming the Russian uh, troops, giving them flowers. They looked very clean people, and they claimed that these were Ukrainians who are welcoming Russians with open arm. H- how do you respond to all this? Well, I, I, I don't know of any single example where they were actually welcomed with uh, open yeah. arms. So actually, in fact, if you look, uh, if you study the materials uh, in any major town, it was mostly pro-Ukrainian. Actually, people without uh, weapons were protesting en masse against the Russian troops. And in the first few days, the Russians didn't know how to respond. They did not expect it. So the soldiers were just standing there looking frightened. Uh, Now they do. They are kind of doing a cleansing there. So catching activists, the FSB, that is the secret service, is working behind the front lines. We know of a lot of arrests of people who, with pro-Ukrainian leanings or former veterans, you know, getting caught disappearing. There were some filtration camps, so they've kind of deported some people to Russia. This also has happened. So you believe these were actors? No, I mean, look, uh, for all purposes, uh, you know how the Russian propaganda works. It's actually quite simple. They manufacture... Usually blatant lies, actually very primitive, right? It's not yeah. something complex. Then they essentially pump money into promoting this wherever they can, through on social media, through their yeah. media channels, which are fortunately getting shut down now, etc. So it's, it's actually pretty simple. You manufacture lies, and then you just try to spread it by throwing money at it. This yeah. is how they work, yeah, and it's nothing complex. And uh, mainly, mainly, uh, they do it by, um, you know, uh, they, 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 it's not like they can uh, manipulate facts, you know, play something, um, toy with reality, right? Because they're very yeah. far from it. 
What they are yeah. manufacturing is mostly blatant lies. So they simply stick to it. They yeah. throw in these stupid things, the fakes, and then just try to promote them massively to create an impression that a lot of people believe in this. This is yeah. a very simple technology that they're using. This is yeah. what they're trying to use now in Ukraine. Fortunately, I don't think this is successful in the U.S. in particular. So I don't think they are succeeding in this. I don't think people are falling for this. Not after what has been in Bucha. Look, there are hundreds of American reporters there by now. You know, hundreds of American people. And literally, you know, if, if anyone has doubts, you can come over or you can come over here after the war and take a look at it, right? I mean, Bucha is right there near Kiev. It's a suburb of Kiev. This is where all their murders, et cetera, et cetera, happened, literally, right? So uh, there are, look, I've seen dozens of American volunteers there on, yeah. on the one segment of the front line where I was. Uh, overall, there are thousands, thousands yeah. of U.S. people fighting for Ukraine right now. They've all seen it, right? So I don't think, I don't think this lies will stick. Right. That, that's a good question you brought in about the volunteers. How, how effective are these volunteers in the Ukraine war right now that are fighting mm, among the Ukraine? Look, the guys I've seen were pretty good. So most nice. of them veterans. Yeah, pretty good. So, so the, these were these were experienced American people. Military and, veterans that had joined the fight against the Russians and fighting in the side. Yeah, of I mean, I, I I did I never uh, you know we we prefer yeah. not to ask their bios yeah. or backgrounds, yeah, yeah, but they clear yeah. clearly knew what they were doing. Like nice and 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 the, of course probably these are combat veterans who have seen seen it all and experienced and um, i would expect so yes and uh, and um and how effective is that that you guys have in volunteers from the united states from other countries from the uk how effective is that they're fighting right there like what what are they bringing to the table that is different than any other ukrainian fighter uh look first of all they're all bringing knowledge of western weapons right nice. which is right they i mean the ukraine is being supplied uh, by the West, Western weapons are clearly superior to the Russian ones on all counts. I mean, wherever we tested the Stinger missile, it was superior to whatever the Russians have in terms of um, low-level anti-air. Yeah. Uh, the Western anti-tank weapons are superior to what the Russians have, and they're actually very effective against Russian vehicles. Right now, there is more heavy equipment coming in Ukraine as part of the U.S. land lease program. I've recently introduced by the Congress, by the Senate, by the President. Yeah. And uh, we will see how it works, but I'm pretty sure that, again, this will be more of the same. It's clearly superior. Western technology is clearly much superior to the Russian technology. Absolutely. right? And what these guys are bringing to the table, at the very least, is knowledge of this. But again, these are very professional, very motivated people who clearly know what they're doing, who understand that they are fighting on the front line of freedom, who clearly have a sense of duty, uh, you know, in a way that they fought for the free world in various places, in the U.S. military or wherever they were previously, now on the front lines in Ukraine. So they, they kind of understand why they are there, and they are good, efficient, professional, motivated people. So uh, only, yeah. you know, my good graces to them and great thanks to them, because they are a great help. What do, you, what do you think the different... What When you look at this war right now, it's been happening for uh, quite a long time now, what are, what is the difference right now between the Russian soldier and the Ukrainian soldier that's in the ground? Well, first of all, it's motivation. Ukrainian soldier is fighting for his home and for his life, right? And essentially, uh, yeah. for the majority of them, there is no, yeah. you know, nowhere to go to is if the country is lost. The Russian okay. soldier doesn't really know what he's fighting for, and his life is not very valued by them. So, you know, they throw away soldiers easily. They throw them into frontal attacks against Ukrainian positions. They die. No one cares. They yeah. seemingly understand that. So whenever possible, they actually prefer to just dig in and wow. just stick to their positions and don't do anything. They're not very motivated. And this is something interesting you, you mentioned. You know, here, Tom, we heard so much about Ukrainian casualties. Mm -hmm. We hear what goes on in the Ukraine every single day. And open is right above the table. We don't hear much of the Russian casualties. Well, the numbers you hear are, are all over the place from yeah. uh, the U.S. and from Ukraine and then what the Russians are right. reporting. But I thought it was really interesting that Pablo said, um, you know, Russia's a paper tiger. I wonder, yeah. like, what, what does this mean in the near future and then going farther down the road with, like, you know, China's alliance with Russia? If, they, if China perceives Russia like the rest of the world maybe right now being not quite the military power that they thought they were, what... Like, what's that going to mean in the near future? And uh, is what about Ukrainian offensives with Russia? Well, I mean, you know, it seems like everyone is uh, coming to grips with this now. So no one actually expected them uh, 
to to be this week, right? So probably there were doubts after what they did in Syria about their military capabilities, right? Because yeah. uh, as you probably know, they were not very, they were very successful in killing a lot of civilians in Syria, but they were not very militarily successful, right? Yeah, uh, it was it was actually a lot like Ukraine. So massive no, artillery it- strikes, frontal assaults, and no 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 results. So same here. Uh, I think everyone, including China, is still coming to grips with what to do with this. Because Chinese, you know, traditionally, they they were communists, right? They relied on Soviet Union in terms of their doctrine, in terms of how they fought, their technology. And now they are probably coming to grips with the fact that they've based their military on something which is clearly second rate to uh, the West, which they pretend to fight against or whatever, coming to coming to conflict with slowly, right? So I think everyone will have to do, you know, a lot of thinking uh, what this means. The main problem I see with Russia, you know, if it weren't a military, um, a nuclear power, uh, this would probably be the end of it, right? So we would clearly see that it's beatable, its conventional military capabilities are not strong enough. Uh, this would be some, somehow the end of it. Uh, question is what to do with a military power that is uh, at the same time incompetent, rather reckless and not very competent politically, because clearly they've made massive, huge miscalculations, right? You know, a competent political leadership cannot afford to make the miscalculations they made. And at the same time, that possesses nukes, right? So somehow it's our, it's a problem for all of us, right? So it's like a monkey with a grenade, right? Which now has to be managed somehow. Yeah. That will be probably the problem, uh, going forward, though, again, I mean, uh, we understand clearly that they are depending on uh, on the West, right? They are not, uh, you know, they're not like the Soviet Union used to be, where that at least was fully independent and kind of autarkic, right? Closed within you, its borders. Are you afraid? Are you afraid, Pablo? That are you afraid that Russia is going to lose more and more? That eventually will end up using a nuclear power, nuclear weapons against the Ukraine. So not really, no, not at this stage. So we don't really see any signs of it, and neither do Western intelligence, which, and I have to say Western intelligence was pretty spot on for the last year on what Russia's plans yeah. were. So I, I tend to trust uh, your intelligence community pretty big. Uh, not at this point. I mean, they're afraid. Look, uh, you have to understand that economically they are totally dependent on the West, actually. They're yeah. essentially like your fuel station, right? That, that's like a fuel station near your town where everyone fuels their cars. You know, if everyone stops fueling there, the fuel station is out of business. That's what Russia is. Right? They supply oil and gas. Ultimately, that's the only business they How, how long do you think at. Russia can hold this fight for? Sorry? How, how long do you think Russia can hold this fight for? Good question. Uh, I think, uh, you know, it, it will all depend on how quickly the Western weapons are integrated into the Ukrainian military effort, how effective they are, and actually how smart Russia is. I mean, if I were them, I'd be looking to get out of this fight now. While they still hold some territory, while they're still, let's say, at military parity with Ukraine, right, they're still trying to push somewhere, not very successfully, but they're still trying to... I wouldn't. If I were them, I wouldn't wait for a situation where potentially... Uh, the Ukrainian military arm by the West could start pushing back against me. But that's uh, talking about smart moves, right? And what Russia has been doing in the last months was anything but smart, right? So we can maybe expect some dumb moves from them. That's the main problem with them. You know, when you're dealing with someone stupid, it's hard to forecast his behavior. Yeah. I mean, what? what so you believe that uh, Russia will stop at some point and pull the troops and go back where it come from? You know, the smart move in a situation where they clearly miscal- miscalculated would be to look for some kind of back away option, right? That yeah. would well, That's what a smart person would do in this situation. And that's what I believe, uh, too. We, we brought in a, a U.S. Army Colonel, John H. Burke, who is extremely experienced as a military intelligence officer. And everything you and Mr. Roman Shermeta have said in the last two uh, segments was spot on it, what he said. He did say that the Russian military was not as strong as we thought. Now you see all the holes. Now um, we see that the Russians are not like really what we thought they were. Look how they are losing in the Ukraine. I mean, at at some point, do do you believe that Russia is going to run to a dead end? Or do you think they just really need any excuse to use so they can say we won this war so they can pull out and go where they come from? 
Uh, I'm sorry, Ahmed. I think I lost you for a second. Could I'm you sorry. Please repeat so, it. Do you believe that they just they feel that they they just need an excuse to to pull out? Do they just need an excuse to say we won the war so they can pull out of the Ukraine? Do you feel that like they're stuck? in the Ukraine, they don't know whether to back up or to stay in the Ukraine. Look, I'm pretty sure, you know, the closer to the front lines, the more that's what they're feeling. I mean, question is, look, they are not a democracy, right? They are an authoritarian system, where essentially there's a guy at the top who's been there for 20 years, who does not take no for an answer, uh, who probably cleansed his own inner circle to reflect his own opinions, right? So it's, it's not like he has to contend with someone else's opinion yeah. how well informed he is and what's in his brain god knows you know look yeah. right before the war he came out with some crazy two-hour yeah. lectures on history where he was literally talking to lenin and stalin uh -huh. i mean this was unbelievable look and this guy has nukes and you know commands armies that that's that's the problem right i mean if we were dealing with something at least half democratic Right, we would more or less understand what to expect because a democracy is kind of automatic. You know, when everyone sees something for a fact, this is a fact. Right? I mean, the country, the state just falls with the policies that contend with that fact. And In I an authoritarian system, you know, you can have a total, you can have a leader totally in illusion, right? Until he gets hit on the head with something. It's about legacy. It's not about, it's really not about the Ukraine. That's how I felt with how Putin is going. It's about his legacy. It's about, he's trying and to build something. Look, it's also about basing policies on something yeah. very, very misinformed, right? On something that yeah. he probably wants to believe, but that is not grounded in fact. I mean, I'm not sure he's well informed about the scale of his military problems. Yeah. They are clear from the map, right? If he attacked Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, in the first days and failed to take it, and then retreated totally away from it, he clearly has problems, right? If on the third month of the war, where he intended to take the whole country in a couple of days, he's yeah. sitting at a stretch along the border with all his military, yeah. uh, you clearly see, you mean, I mean, that's so objective, you cannot run away from this fact. So I'm kind of pitch, pitching my hopes on the fact that he, at the very least he sees that. Even if he gets... Yeah. A misreporting on, on the losses, right? If his generals pretend they've wiped out Ukrainian military several times through already, you know, all the things that they are probably exaggerating. At the very least, the map does not lie, right? He clearly is not successful judging by it. So that's what I'm kind of staging my hopes that this is dawning on the guy and the people around him that, yeah, they have to extricate this, uh, themselves somehow from this. Uh, of course, you know, as long as they continue sending soldiers into the fray, they can go in for a long while, which is why the land lease is necessary, right? Because at some point, uh, if this goes on, Ukrainian military will simply start pushing them back using yeah. Western weapons, which are way more advanced than whatever Russia has. Right? I mean, I can clearly say you that, you know, after, after actually fighting these guys, right, uh, I would really be scared to fight American military, right? <laughs> with with the high tech weapons, with precision weapons. Hey, hey, you know, I understand you know what, that because we've we've been through it all. We have, you know, Iraq, Afghanistan, or we've been through this. And truly, what I have seen is that the Ukraine is not any different than Iraq or Afghanistan resisting against uh, a foreign enemy. Uh, and and I gotta say, I'm I'm extremely impressed, man, by the Ukraine extremely impressed by as them as a nation as how resilient they are and any other president in the middle east in my opinion would have ran away at this point um i don't care what people think my well, respect all, all goes to zelensky for holding the fight against such a powerful country like russia so far and um and, and this brings a question here that is the american people been boiling on this question here um we have an audience in this country, unfortunately, was pushing what looked like a Putin agenda. And they, you know, they came up with a lot of things that are unchecked and unverified information. And one of these claims were, um, which I was accused on by supporting the Ukraine. I woke up and I, I just said, you know, I support the Ukraine. And people said, why, why are you supporting Nazis? And that's where I stopped, right? Because I wasn't informed in the history. I wasn't informed in... So, so how do you... How do you answer this, Pablo, that they are 
uh, claiming that the Ukraine is Nazis and that Russia is acting as self-defense. This is something very big, important people here in this country has pushed, uh, which is people in Fox News, people in, in, in influencers. How do you really answer that? How, how do we put this claim to sleep? Uh, claiming that the Ukrainians are Nazis, they are, uh, you know, that Russia was trying to uh, act in self-defense and try to denazify the, the Ukraine. H- how do you put that to sleep? Well, look, I mean, you know, that I, I don't remember who, but some some guy right after World War II said that the, the Nazis of the next generation will be calling themselves anti-Nazis, right? And this is exactly what happened. So, you know, Russia, under this pretense of reconstructing World War II again, fighting against Nazis, essentially turned itself into a rather perfect Nazi regime, right? And with those genocidal actions happening in Ukraine, they've kind of solidified it. They were fascist, a fascist authoritarian dictatorship before, and now they've essentially are starting to commit genocide, like actual genuine Nazis did 70 years ago. So it's like, you know, it's like trying to answer a claim from a Nazi blaming his victim for Nazism, right? This is very weird that here we are even discussing this, right? If, I mean, look at their ideology. Look at look at what uh, they are telling the world. They're clearly megalomaniac. I mean, they, uh, look, uh, you have to understand that they actually pretend to think they are fighting the U.S. in Ukraine, right? They are not, uh, they are trying to think about Ukrainians as some kind, some kind of inferior people, right? Like, like yeah. Nazis thought about the Jews. Yeah, right. this is what they're trying to do, and they are pretending they are fighting the U.S. There, that Ukraine is somehow a proxy for the Americans. Yeah. They constantly pretend yeah. that they are the U.S. is their major enemy. It's actually strange for me that people even uh, like Russia in the states. I mean, you if you talk to Russians, they hate the Americans. This wasn't yeah. the fact like twenty or thirty years ago, but yeah. now after twenty years of propaganda, they hate the Americans. I mean, these are the <laughs> anti-American guys. Look, I mean, why would you even like them? I mean, they yeah. are your enemies. If there is an our enemy, if there's your enemy in the world, this is Russia, yeah. right? <laughs> they mean. are our traditional enemy, and I'm not afraid to say it. They are our traditional enemy. John, you know, Colonel Burke have brought this up the same. Historically, when we didn't have our enemy, we fought each other. Russia is our number one historical, our uh, traditional enemy. And, uh, you know, it shows you their influence in this country. It shows you, like... The propaganda they've been pushing, but pretty much they push the same propaganda they pushed on the Russian people. And um, again, Hamadi, right? If I can yeah. get back to it, of yeah. course, of course. And this is very much a hurt on their pride. They turned out to be anything but on par with the Americans, right? Yeah. So returning to the fact, simple fact of their military performance, which they boasted about for 20 years. I mean, they pretended to be the second military to the United States. They pretended they would somehow be able to compete with the U.S. military, right? That was their pretense. And then it turned out to be they get beaten by Ukraine, which is not a third-rate power. I mean, it's a powerful European military, but it's not a U.S. military, right? And the, yeah. they can't handle the Ukrainian military. Again, I, I, just just to just to give you a bit of a context, especially since, since the show yeah. is for the you know military guys and the intelligence community. You know, yeah. you sit under Russian artillery there on the front lines. You find a good, decent seller. You are kind of relatively safe, right? Unless you get a direct hit on it. Yeah. Nothing hurts you. And then I'm kind of sitting in one of these situations. I was sitting there in that cellar, and I was thinking, okay, right, this was, this is the military pretending to be on par with the U.S. military. I'm not really afraid of them, even when I'm under their artillery fire, because I'm, yeah. I mean, I know I'm relatively safe. What yeah. would I be thinking if I was fighting the Americans who have precision weapons? I mean, my cellar would be destroyed in two minutes. <laughs> I'd be wiped out. Right? Yeah. I mean, so the, they, they are not, they are nowhere near the level. They are a third rate power. They are kind of a third world country that got itself relatively rich on oil, though it only, you know, it's, it's only a small circle of guys around Putin who get rich over it. If I you look at, an, at how an average Russian lives, especially not in Moscow or in Petersburg in the big town, but really, you know, the rural Russia. And compare it with, not with America, not with the American Midwest, but even with Ukraine, you'd clearly understand why they're doing all this violence. They're jealous. I mean, look, these guys were stealing toilets because they haven't wow. fucking seen them, right? They wow. were stealing toilets from this Bucha and right. the of these towns they captured, and bringing them to Russia. They were stealing washing machines because they, they have villages that have only now got water i'm not talking about tap water or something i'm, I'm talking yeah. about water you know like you go you walk out of your house and you you wow. have 
like a well and you do like this and you get water flowing from it. This, this, this is what they're living in. And this is where their soldiers get recruited, right? I mean, their soldiers do not come from the middle class, however shallow and small the middle class is in Russia. They come from the poorest segments of their society. These segments of society mostly live in Kind of like Middle Ages, right? A bit yeah. modernized, you know, Middle Ages with cell phones. That's what I would call what they're living. Now, yeah. imagine these guys being let into a civilized town, right? Imagine, wow. imagine like these half barbarian guys being given Kalashnikov rifles and thrown into not Ukrainian, but a regular rural American town. What would they do then? Maraud, kill, and rape because they are barbarians, right? They are not civilized people. They, 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 w- they would be seeing the civilization for the first time with their own eyes. And their reaction I, would I be seen, the I have same. Seen the destruction. I mean, I have seen the destruction. I have seen the, the, the craziness that, like, every, all the pictures, everything. I follow every single day what's happening. And, and you know, there, there is, uh, a, there's a claim that came out about kidnapping of Ukrainian children, human shields, um, you mentioned genocide, and I, I, I wanted to talk about chemical weapons, kidnap of Ukrainian children. What, what, are, what are the background of these stories uh, of kidnapping children um, or pulling dead bodies back to Russia? Um, uh, you have to understand there are kind of two sides to this story, right, to the yeah. atrocities committed by Russia in Ukraine. Yeah. One is official state policy, which is genocidal by... Uh, its target, right? The, the goal is to erase Ukraine as a nation because they try to pretend that Ukraine does not exist. This is where the culture war comes in. I mean, right now they're trying to take away all the, on, in the occupied territories, Ukrainian language textbooks. They are trying to force the teachers to teach in Russian, right? So they're kind of trying to erase the culture. They were stealing children, right? Children from Mariupol, the town they besieged and almost destroyed right now. Some of them ended up in Russia, and they cannot return to their parents in Ukraine, who are in Ukrainian so control is, territory. There is missing children in the. In the in there is uh, there is at least at least some amount of missing children. Yes, uh, some from Mariupol. Uh, during these evacuations, some children were separated from their parents and ended oh, wait, up you, in why, Russia. And there was a huge scandal around this. What's the point of taking these children to Russia? Look, the same as taking other people to Russia, because they do take some of them to Russia. They are trying to somehow um, modify the ethnic identity, right? They are trying to do an ethnic cleansing. I'm not sure how sophisticated they are in this, but they are doing what they can to do it. That is the official policy part. Now, there is another uh, another part of this story, which relates directly to Bucha, to Gostomo, to places where we've seen this vicious atrocities happen, right? Where we've seen people shot, where we've seen rapes, where we've seen murders, looters, right? Caused by the frontline units, right? It's not clear whether this is official or not official policy. But what I believe this is, this is just simple barbarity uh, executed in situations where no one is watching these soldiers, right? Again, they are recruited from the poorest segment of a poor country. I mean, these villages are half medieval. These people are uneducated, barbarous and for the first time they are seeing a relatively prosperous european neighborhood and the people who live in there and they've been indoctrinated to hate these people right and this is then what happens right this is like you know like the germans during world war ii committed atrocities yeah. against allied soldiers right when during the battle of the bulge they've shot several hundred american soldiers they took prisoners they were famous massacres why yeah. did this happen because these guys were relatively barbarous and also indoctrinated to hate uh, the people they took mm, as prisoners. I, I this is I the saw, same I behavior saw, on part of the Russian soldiers. I, I saw, Pablo, a picture of a, a, a Ukrainian teenager that was raped and thrown to the side of the road. And it's probably one of the most disturbing pictures I've seen. And, uh, you know, that's why I wanted to kind of find out, like, what this is, right? What what really happening, right? Like, I, uh, it's kind of hard for me to say, hey, man, I don't know what side to take. When I see these people raping people, raping teenagers, killing them, throwing them in the side of the road. Uh, at some point, I have to say that I have to really make my decision and not be hesitant to take, make my decision because these individuals are not following any of the Geneva Convention. They're committing war crimes on a daily basis. Do, do you believe that we, America and the West is doing enough to support you guys against Russia? 
Yes, I believe in general, yes, at this point. I mean, I understand the American position, and I understand that it would be reckless to come into a fight for a nuclear power with a nuclear power. I mean, there is a certain responsibility that the fact of being a superpower imposes on you, and it, it is imposed on the U.S., and that is avoiding a nuclear war, right? So this, I understand why the modality of the fight that Ukrainians are fighting and the West is providing resources. I think it's a workable model. I think it can solve the problem. So uh, it, is, it does indeed put kind of the brunt of the fighting on us here, right? Because then we are the ones who have to go into combat and die there if necessary. But again, if that is the only way to resolve the situation, then okay, let's move forward with this solution. But it's a workable solution. And I believe the West right now is, uh, again, the West is, you know, when we're talking about the West, we're talking about very different nations. The US is doing enough. Uh, Some European countries are probably have grown too dependent on Russian resources, even corrupted by Russia to some extent, right? And this needs to be solved going forward. But this does not constitute the U.S. or the U.K., the Anglo-Saxon countries. How do you feel about uh, Germany changing its laws to uh, give you guys weapons or in-time tank missiles? How did you feel about it? Well, that's one of the examples. I mean, for the last 20 years, for the last 50 years since the Soviet times, when they've allowed Soviet natural gas to be supplied to them, counter to the wishes of the U.S., by the way, they've grown dependent on the Russian energy supplies, which was a very dangerous and not very very smart thing to do. So they've earned... Warned warned Germany back then about it. He told them, right? Yeah, he gave her a white flag. Yeah, <laughs> he's like. Yeah, I mean, no, I, I mean, I mean, seriously, they've earned a lot yeah. of money over it, but uh, you know, there are some things money can buy. That is security, for example. Do you they've, believe uh, Germany felt like they're going to be next, or do you feel like any other European neighboring countries of the Ukraine felt that they could that could be them if the Ukraine? Look, I, I feel it's a it's a kind of internal domestic fight in each of these countries. So you can't say like you you can't um, talk about Germany in this sense uh, as a kind of yeah. single entity. There are actually two sides there. There are those who understand clearly the dangers of them. Then there is yeah. was this kind of oligarchy that has grown corrupt and relaxed with this Russian flow of money. They liked it. They've earned a lot over it. And they were kind of lobbying to c- continue because this was good for them. So that that's kind of the an, an internal fight in each of these countries, right? And I'm careful about criticizing the countries because then we're starting to blame the people who are quite innocent in this. Uh, in the things that was done by a very small circle of rather corrupt elites, right? It's it's a bit of a different story, right? It's not correct to blame the people for what the corrupt part of the elite did. Yeah. So, so my my, my question here comes back to uh, how how do you feel about Zelensky's uh, leadership in this war? How do you feel? How do you evaluate him as someone you've been the minister of economy? You've seen him. Uh, you've seen him from the beginning of war, like you know, Mr. Roman Shermeta, when he was in the show. He said he stated he he did not vote for Zelensky during the election, um, and uh, gave his opinion about how his leadership was going through the war. And uh, how do you feel about Zelensky as a as all this pressure on on him? Right, like here in America, you know, we have. People who came out and built a very crazy picture of Zelensky that he's this Nazi guy. He's terrible. He is uh, putting his uh, he's putting his opponents in jail. He is this. He's bad. I, from what I've seen so far, and from what you're seeing so far as a Ukrainian citizen, as someone, as a politician in the Ukraine, how do you feel? Zelensky is doing so far in this war? Well, look, I mean, uh, uh, this whole story about Zelensky being a Nazi, it's already uh, incredibly stupid, right? The guy is a Jew. (laughs) I mean, that's a Jewish Nazi you're talking about. That's only only Russian propaganda can manufacture this bullshit and actually try to promote it. show you how powerful the Russian propaganda machine is. Yeah, but uh, also unbelievably stupid, right? I mean, a Jewish Nazi, can you imagine that? (laughs) But anyway, look, I mean, he's a commander-in-chief, in a nation that's at war, right? Yeah. Overall, I think he's doing his job. He is. Uh, he has stayed in Kiev when he, the town, was, the city was in danger. He has shown leadership. He has uh, led the nation through the crisis. Yeah. So, and and that's essentially where I stand with it. You know, any subtleties of policies that we can agree or disagree on will have to come after the war, 
Absolutely. Right, he's doing his job. He's the commander in chief, and you have to understand. Look, this is not like Zelensky's war or someone else's war. Exactly. This is uh, war. the people's war, right? Yes. This is uh, uh, the war that the whole nation of Ukraine is fighting. And I believe that actually the success, uh, Ukrainian successes, come uh, mostly from you know the small unit leadership, the initiative, the motivation. Even on the, in the military, you see that, that, you know, the Russians are afraid to do anything. They are waiting for orders. They're top down. Ukrainians are motivated. Officers in the field are ready to take the initiative into their hands. And this is what has led to these tremendous results, right? Where by the numbers, you would expect the Russians to break through, to win, and they are losing, right? They are losing because of this difference in motivation and small unit leadership. Ukrainians are fighting in much much closer to what the American manuals would tell you, you're, how you're supposed to fight. I, w- I would say like that. And I wanted to go through a question that actually, uh, uh, these are the fans' questions. They have sent this last night, um, asking these questions. And I know we might already have answered some of these questions, but if you can give us a brief uh, answer to them. Um, so our, our first question that came in um, yesterday for you in person, that came in and said... Uh, how long do you believe Russia can sustain this war before their economic collapse? Oh, good question. You know, I think as long as they're selling oil and gas, uh, they can actually go on for years. Uh, I'll explain to you why I think that. Uh, because ultimately, ultimately, I mean, their economic model, the core of it, is very, very simple. As I've said, it's an economic model of a fuel sta- of a gas station, right? So yeah. as long as the gas station can sell gas, it generates cash flow that it can live off. Their people will be living in poverty. Uh, nevertheless, again, the, the, this broad class that is the base of support for Putin and where Russian soldiers are recruited has been living in poverty forever. These people have never seen any kind of prosperity. These are not middle classes who have seen the Western way of life. This is Middle Ages plus cell phones. That's how they're living. And their yeah. life will not change materially because of sanctions, as long as the money keep coming. If a, a total embargo on energy exports is introduced, then, of course, they will run out of money quite quickly. It will be a matter of weeks or a month. But it's not yet introduced, and it's even if it's coming, it will be coming in some stages, and they will be trying to circumvent it. So I think purely economically, it can take a long, long time, and it might not be successful. What, what will be what, more what, successful um, is a battlefield victory. What, what sanctions do you think um, would really make, like, what sanctions do you think that would really um, make a difference uh, against Russia? Take away their ener- earnings from energy experts. That that's about the only thing. I mean, that's that's the only major important segment of their economy that you know that that is important really. Everything else, I mean, there's a lot of stuff happening around these sanctions. A lot of companies exiting, you know, financial sanctions. A lot of subtleties. A lot of different actions by different countries. But when you look at it in a nutshell, the first thing the West did, which was hugely important, was arrest the Russian foreign currency reserves, which are actually money generated over time from the sales of their oil and gas, of their energy, right? Yeah. So these assets that were generated by this uh, economy were frozen. But the cash flow from selling energy continues to go because they continue selling it, right? So if you want to starve them of money, you should close that, right? Right. As simple yeah. as that. These are kind of two major actions. Everything else are secondary. Is, is American soldiers needed in this fight? Uh, again, I haven't seen uh, American soldiers officially sent to Ukraine. I believe none are there. Feel like they didn't I've seen them. quite a lot of Americans who p- most likely have military experience. They're already there. And they are doing a great job. They're doing a great part. And yes, they are quite welcome. Uh, but if you were asking about official U.S. boots on the ground, no, yeah. I don't think they're necessary there. And I think this would be a wrong move at this point. I mean, yeah. weapons, yeah. people who volunteer who are not officially related to the U.S., who want to come and fight for freedom, they are welcome. Otherwise, you, create, you know, with enough support, Ukraine can win on the battlefield. And, and this puts the claim to sleep that, you know, uh, we don't want our sons and daughter to go there to die. The Ukrainians themselves are telling you, we don't need you. 
here, if you would like to be here and fight with us against Russia, you are welcome, but we don't need U.S. boots in the ground officially. And I, I know they've been saying this, we've been saying this, but of course, you know, when you have people coming on the media, reporters telling, trying to make it more about the war, trying to make it that we may lose soldiers in the Ukraine, that we don't need to go to this conflict, that we don't need to support the Ukraine against the Russia. And I think some of that is Russian propaganda. It's basically trying to get mm. the American people to pressure its government from not supporting the Ukraine. Right. And we saw that. Yeah, to make people afraid that their sons will yeah. be sent over we here. That. No, if, if they want to, they are welcome. But if uh, someone is forced to, no, don't, don't. I mean, it, yeah. it's, there's enough casualties here already. We don't need people killed who are not ready for this, right? Who are not ready to take this risk. Getting back to um, Pablo talking about the energy, um, you know, it's like our, our current policy that we've crippled our own energy production sector. Yeah. That's a lot to blame for this. Yeah. You know, where <laughs> Europe should be depending on us for natural exactly. gas and oil. Yeah. And we put ourselves and the rest of the world in danger by this, by this lunacy that we have. We're sitting on more gas and oil than the rest yeah. of the world combined. Um, but Pablo, the one thing that's really um, sticking out in this interview is your sense of optimism for the people of Ukraine. I, I feel like you feel like this is going to end eventually in a very positive way for Ukraine. Look, I believe so, definitely. Yes, I think, I mean, war is terrible. <clears throat> but uh, at least, uh, you know, this war has, uh, I'd say, clearly shown who's who, right? Uh, yeah. And uh, clearly, you know, the worst danger Ukraine has had since it, since it got independence 30 years ago, ultimately was Russia, right? Because of this quirk in Russian mentality out of which their modern-day Nazis grew, right? They're crazy about Ukraine. They, they cannot stand the fact that the nation exists. It's like, it's like this quirk that Hitler had with Jews, right? They have the same with Ukrainians. So the fact that, okay, they went to the fight and they're losing now, right? And the world clearly sees who they are. And what danger they pose to the world. Because Ukrainian case is extreme, but Ukraine is not the only country they're attacking. I mean, they were trying to undermine American democracy. They're trying to continue to do this right now. In various ways. You know, sometimes uh, some parties in the U.S. think that, oh, well, it's about one party, not the other party. They are quite bipartisan in their hatred of the Americans. They really hate the U.S. They, um, uh, I would even put it like this. I mean, they covered the status of a superpower. They are jealous about the American success. And at the same time, they hate the Americans, right? And they are a very dark society, right? They, they, they are, uh, in, as a society, they are psychologically very problematic. That's how I would put and it, they right? they show that in Ukraine. Right, uh, yes. And, 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 and Ukraine is uh, something close to them which they can hate and they can try to hit. I mean, U.S. is big, U.S. is far away, U.S. is way more yeah. powerful than they are. They can't do anything about the U.S. But, uh, you know, have no uh, illusions. They don't like you. They hate you. They hate the Americans. They, wow. they are jealous about the Americans. They are jealous about the U.S. They think of themselves as losers that have lost the Cold War, they have lost everything and they, they have the, the, you know, they are traumatized by this psychologically. And the problem is that instead of, you know, trying to heal this trauma in some kind of normal fashion, right, like the Germans did after World War II by serious internal discussion and review of their history, instead of that, they're simply trying to, you know, boil it in blood or something, right? They're murderous about this trauma. They are like Germany uh, pre-World War II, well, in World War II right now. They've gone crazy. That's the problem, right? So may, may have no illusions about them. You're not dealing, you're not talking about a normal country, right? I mean, I mean, th this is what goes back. It goes back to Putin wants to building his own legacy. He wants to build his own legacy. He wants to go down in history as the greatest president ever led Russia. He wants to bring Russia back to the world stage as a massive power. And that's what I believe in my heart, that this is way bigger than we think. This guy is getting older. He is thinking differently. And what's going through his mind is, how do you feel? There's a lot of things that have been going on here, Pablo, about thinking. Um, people thinking here that some of the Russian generals would eventually have enough and end up assassinating Putin. How, how do you feel about that? Well, you know, everyone hopes for that. I'm everyone just not sure how that. realistic is that. I mean, everyone, I think, from 
Kiev to Washington to Beijing. I know everyone would hope to for Moscow, that, right? Yeah. <laughs> to Moscow, probably, right? <laughs> to any sane person hopes for that. Because yeah. this kind of resolves the problem, right? It allows everyone yeah. to at least sit back and try to get the situation back into the realm of uh, something not as crazy as it is right now. Because, because this is literally crazy. I mean, it's 21st fucking century, and we are living through this, right? Through something we never... Th- I mean, our great-grandfathers had to live through in World War II, but that was almost yeah. 100 years ago. This is crazy. And it's... It, it, you know, I have one question here on... It's a from uh, someone who sent this question... And uh, this person actually has uh, been uh, staying undecided about supporting the Ukraine. And this is, um, my sounds a, a very tricky question. And if you're not familiar with it, you don't have to answer it. Uh, w- why did Zelensky put sanctions on Sheikh Mansour battalion last year while they fought bravely in 2014? Uh, let me try to remember the situation. I think... Uh, if I remember correctly, yeah. uh, there was some bureaucratic stupidity uh, related. If, uh, if uh, I think Sheikh, Sheikh Mansour Battalion is, again, if, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is a Muslim yeah. uh, yes. battalion consisting of Chechen mm-hmm. uh, fighters yes. who yes. are yes. in opposition to the Russian regime, right, yes. who, who yes. had to emigrate. And Correct. they are fighting in Ukraine. There in was Ukraine. some bureaucratic stupidity related to them. And, you know, mind you, any bureaucracy is stupid. U.S. bureaucracy is stupid. Sometimes Ukrainian bureaucracy can also quite often be stupid. There was something yeah. happening yeah. to them. And it was actually canceled then. So there was a public outcry in Ukraine, right? Not yeah. foreign, in Ukraine. And then it got to foreign news. And then uh, they canceled. I mean, I've seen uh, Muslim fighters on the front lines. Actually, various nationalities, and you know it's 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 kind of crazy that uh, when you have Muslim fighters fighting your side, that's when they can accuse you of being a terrorist, right? And then that's when they can hold things. It, in reality, uh, the majority of these Muslims are Ukrainian citizens, and they're fighting for their for their own country. They're defending their own land. Um, how effective do you believe that the Chechenian fighters that are fighting among the Ukraine are uh, against Russia? Well, Chechen are generally good uh, military. Yeah, uh, you know they 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 have this warrior culture, and uh, yeah. I think they are pretty good. I haven't seen them too much personally. Actually, look, the guys, the Muslim guys yeah. I've seen were American, right? oh, wow. <laughs> so they, they, and probably so probably of, not... probably of <laughs> Ira- Ira- Iranian origin. So they're kind okay, of more, so more very, Iranian opposition, Putin. right? So this is very tough on Putin. Not only they are Muslims, they're also American. <laughs> they're American Muslim. Also, to add insult to injury, most likely veterans of <laughs> some. Wow. Either U.S. military or some other U.S. Or either right? Taliban or Al Qaeda. <laughs> they are not, not definitely. I'm probably okay. they fought against Taliban or Al Qaeda. I, I, I would expect them to do oh, that. Th- th- this is this got to be tough, man. This got to be really tough. On Russia, yeah, right? yeah. Not only you have Muslims fighting in your borders, you're also having uh, U- U.S. U.S. Muslims, it's, right? It's every, against... Everything that's Russia's afraid of. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Well, you got to give Abutin credit on this one, uh, Pablo. <laughs> but know? again, uh, returning to the Chechen question, yes, yeah. uh, they are, of course, uh, yeah. effective. I haven't seen them personally. They are, as you know, um, Chechnya is, for the last 15 years, it's controlled by a warlord called Kadyrov, yeah. Imp- imposed by Putin, supported by Russian arms. He's created, like, his personal fief there. And yeah. there are people he's recruited who are fighting against yeah. Ukrainian military on the Russian side. On the Russian side. So, yeah, it's like but there is a lot of hatred between the Chechens who actually continued fighting yeah. for their homeland and yeah. these Chechens that switch sides. There's a lot of bad blood between them. Bad blood between the Chechens in your side and the Chechens in And Putin's the side. Chechens supporting yeah. Russia, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and I, and I, I do, um, you know, I do believe in my heart uh, I'm glad that these Chechens found refuge in your country because now they are uh, fighting their enemy right there in Ukraine against uh, Russia and it's and and Ramadan Kadyrov and and how do you feel about this Ramadan Kadyrov? R- R- Ramzan, like, Ramzan. Yeah, Ramzan, Ramzan right? Well, we call let's, him Ramzan, let's yeah. say I'm not yeah. a fan. <laughs> yeah, okay. no, nobody is right. But how how do you feel about like this guy coming to power by the help of Putin? And now he's using Chechens to fight other nations and 
and, and, and especially Chechnya, right? They got attacked by Russia the same exact way. Um, well, but then that just give you an insight into what Putin's regime really is, right? They, yeah. So what happened in Chechnya, they invaded one time, they lost. They invaded second time, couldn't really win. So they kind of found the most vicious and corrupt warlord they could and made him yeah. the king of the country, gave him money, let him slaughter Russian soldiers. I mean, the guy killed Russian soldiers before he kind of joined them. He, was, he had videos of them cutting their throats, right? He was hated by Russian secret service. And then they let him rule the country and do whatever he wants, just in exchange for loyalty. I mean, that, that, that's the nature of how they do it. No principles, no values, money and power, raw, yeah, don't care Vladimir, about anything Vladimir else. Vladimir Putin runs That's, that's his, how they run the show, and that's how they've managed to build a paper tiger military, right? Because you cannot build a military without values. You know, you, you won't have people ready to sacrifice their lives if yeah. all you're about is being corrupt and stealing money. They clearly see it. And this is why the Russian soldiers are so badly motivated compared to Ukrainian ones. Because Ukrainians have their homes to fight for and their families. And what these guys have to fight for? Putin's money? Putin's palaces? What? What are they fighting for here? Exactly. Ultimately, ultimately, you know, in the real sense. Not in the propaganda sense that they have in their minds instilled. But in the real yeah. sense. I mean, they don't have a skin in this game. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, here, here in, uh, in America, we... Uh, a, a lot of uh, Americans or uh, American politicians in general thought you guys have bio labs. Uh, and uh, Roman Sharmetta have answered this question uh, perfectly, but I do want to bring it by your intention. Um, how do you feel about that? About you know the accusations of uh, the Ukraine having bio labs. Um, they accuse the Ukraine being behind COVID. Uh, it, it's so many things, man. Like it's, I, and I know it's, you do realize it's the Russians yeah. again trying to pretend they're American. I mean, they're yeah. just taking the what happened in Iraq in 20 years yeah. ago and yeah. trying to recycle it into some kind of crazy social media story and yeah. trying to push it. I mean, they are, look, guys, they're jealous of they're jealous of the U.S. They, yeah. they, their dream is for one second for someone to recognize them as something equal to the U.S. That that's what they're driving them really they I mean, want psychologically deep down inside. So basically, they, are, Russia they feel as they are losers, right? They are losers compared to the Americans, and then they desperately want to get out of this position. I mean, they are traumatized. You have to understand that. That's why so, they are constantly pretending to be. They want to be a superpower. They are pretending they are on equal footing with the U.S. But that that that's just how it is. Look, I mean, they they like your, you know, I don't know some you know, traumatized guy in, in, yeah. in high school, you know, looking up to the local, I know, football champion and trying to pretend he is like that. Something, something along these lines. It, it, it's kind of like social, it's all about social psychology, ultimately, at the end of it. So my last question is, is if this war is over tomorrow, what is next for the Ukraine? What's after the war? for the Ukraine now? Well, and this for Ukraine, what's next is obviously rebuilding. Rebuilding the economy, rebuilding the military. You have to understand that Ukraine would be a bulwark against further aggression by Russia, right? If Russia stays in this current state, which we have to assume it will, it will return at some point. It will try to. Maybe it will be more successful. Maybe it won't be corrupt Putin's regime, but some military regime, more efficient, right? So the danger will still be there. It again will be starting with Ukraine. So Ukraine will have to become a bulwark against it. Some kind of security arrangement would have to be brought, created. Uh, yeah. But personally, frankly speaking, what I believe in is not some kind of security guarantees, which are not very credible when we're dealing with nuclear powers, but yeah. a very, very strong Ukrainian military. And We've are, are seen you... that it's capable, right? The people are capable, professional. It consists yeah. of veterans. There are millions of people now who have served as me, for example, as volunteers yeah. on the front lines who used to be civilians who now have military experience. Yeah. So correctly equipped, well-funded, well-maintained military yeah. machine with these people with a large, huge reserve and well-equipped professional military can hold the line. Right, so that's what I believe in. Yes, I believe building Ukrainian military would be in the best interest of Ukrainians, but also in the best interests of the West. I think this uh, partnership would have to go a long way. And it, it would keep the Western, so particularly the American soldiers. Remember, we, we're talking West, but ultimately when power has to be brought in, we're talking about the Americans, right? Because it's the U.S. military that's 
That's the main military of the West, right? And uh, I think for the Americans, it's better to have a strong Ukrainian military keeping some regions secure than to have to brought in your own guys when push comes to shove in that region, right? It's simply, it's a very rational, you know, not, not uh, it's a very rational thought. It's a very rational idea. So I think this strategic partnership will have to grow stronger and continue, and it will be very beneficial to both sides. What is Zelensky's future after the war? Look, we'll see. I mean, it's politics. Maybe he'll be popular, get reelected. Maybe he'll get unpopular, get reelected. Someone else will get elected. It's democracy. You know, the yeah. point of democracy and the yeah. fun of democracy is you don't. It's ultimate as long as not to someone crazy doesn't get elected. It doesn't yeah. matter. You know, it's all about the will, will of the people, the institutions, the system. If it works correctly everything will go well. So I, I don't really, I'm not thinking about this in terms of yeah. this politician or that politician. I'm thinking about this in terms of the, the democracy has yeah. to be protected and preserved. And the Russians democracy. are not attacking concrete figures. They are oh. attacking the idea of democracy itself. That's what their attack is about in Ukraine. So let me ask you this. as, as uh, You are obviously one of the youngest po- politicians in the Ukrainian government. No, not really. Oh, there's uh, really young actually, people. Actually, yeah, it's, oh, the Ukrainian oh. government is quite young, actually, right? So oh, no, I, and I've started the working in the government eight years ago at relatively yeah. high-level positions. So when I was wow. in my late 20s. Late uh, 20s, yeah. So I, I, I would ask you this. If this war is over and you are back at the election, would you vote for Zelensky? Possibly. I'd look at the whole lineup. You know, you try yeah. to choose the best. But yeah, I mean, he, he performed pretty well, maybe. Yeah. So that, that's the nice part is that what I loved about this is that I've seen people who did not vote for Zelensky are given Zelensky the credit that he deserves, that they're sure. not stripping him out of his credit. They're giving him the support he needs to to fight this enemy. Look, I mean, he's a commander in chief and I've just yeah. returned from the front lines. In a war, yeah. you support your commander in chief. That's how it works. As simple as that. And, and Tom, it doesn't it's... matter who the guy is. You know, you salute the rank, not the man. Yeah. Is not this a problem we're having right now? Like, do you believe that we are in this country right now so divided that people are not looking to support the commander in chief in any commander in chief because they just don't like him? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the division has happens in, uh, you know, by design in so many ways, but that's to weaken, I think, just to weaken the influence of the U.S. Let's be honest. If Biden goes to war tomorrow against Russia, I mean, is is. The other side, or if a Trump w- wrote a war against Russia, is well, well, is the other side going to give the support and the the right, well, the, 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 the 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 commander in chief needs, or do you think we have really went too far? Well, see, I think that's that's the one thing that yeah. you know they used to say politics in the U.S. was between the forty yard lines. You yeah. know, most people you had a left or a right view, but you were all very pro American. Yeah, and I think you know, like we talked about in the last um, podcast, yeah. was this Russian over the years, this yeah. ideological subversion where, yeah. where they pushed Marxism. And now yeah. where most of our country or half of our country yeah. has these pro-Marxist views without even understanding it. Yeah. You know, and so now when you have this idea of like, well, you know, questioning what you see in the media, um, it's like, I, I think everybody I know supports the Ukrainian people. I just feel yeah. like they, they've been undecided or confused. Well, no, but the yeah. Ukrainian people are, are pawns yeah. in you know, they're, they're suffering the consequences of, yeah. of all this division. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, if, if, if there was something, I, I would hope that the country supports the military, even yeah. if you don't support the necessary commander in chief. But again, I think it's, this yeah. division has been to decrease the, yeah. the U.S. Um, influence yes. in the world. You know? Like we don't need to go to war with Russia, but we do need to limit Russia's influence or limit Russia's pushing its power outside of its borders, attacking neighboring right. countries or <laughs> allies. I think that's always been a very, you know, I guess conservative point of view is containing, containing Russia. Um, you know, so again, I, I think supporting our military has always been having a strong military. I, I hope NATO realizes now yeah. um, why Trump was pushing for that 2% <laughs> GDP, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think NATO needs to, like, gets itself back together these countries you know to be honest like look they could be next 
right? right? It's, it's, it's if easier. Putin had it easy, do you think Putin would have not intimidated those other countries, Poland, all the other countries? Well, absolutely. It's, he it's, would. It's much easier to, to really stop it before it starts. Yeah. And, and again, you know, we had a whole year where this, this war, I feel like, yeah, may not have had to happen. Yeah. Um, but, you know, by, by not helping Ukraine earlier. Yeah. His plans were to take the Ukraine in 11 days. Yeah. It's day what? 50 now? 60? What? It's what the that? third month of the war, right? And third his plans are nowhere, nowhere near uh, yeah. being accomplished. And, and it's zero really chance of them being accomplished right now. Yeah. yeah. So that's why I think Putin needs to put the idea of trying to compete with the United States to sleep because uh, you're still stuck in the Ukraine. And you are losing a lot, and your casualties are crazy, and your weapon stocks just went down to the trash. I don't think anybody is going to respect uh, the the Russian tanks anymore, or the right. Russian weaponry systems, or any of that. Right, Pablo? Do you see that um, that sense of like uh, morale decreasing in, in the average Russian soldier then? Well, you know, we haven't been uh, talking to them more like firing at them. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> yes, in general, I, I would imagine they're not very happy. Again, what I can tell you, right, you know, specifically on the southern front line, what yeah. they are doing, they're trying to dig in. They're very scared of Western weapons. I mean, you, you'd seen, you, you, you'd laugh if you'd seen like three and a half meter. Uh, these um, dugouts they made for their tanks, so the tank is totally hidden there, so that it cannot be noticed. Because if if their turrets were sticking out, our guys would kind of uh, c- 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 crawl <laughs> yeah. towards them and shoot a javelin at them, and it hits from above, so <laughs> the tank gets killed. They are very, very scared, really very yeah. scared of Western weapons. Okay. They are not particularly eager to fight or to attack wherever. It, it's, I think they are pretty happy to sit where they are. Uh, so no, I mean, and they never really, you know, apart from the propaganda, they never they wanted it easy, right? They they never expected to have to fight a real war. They weren't really ready for it. They weren't ready to die at mass. They were, yeah. I think, shocked by that, right? So no, you know, look again. I mean, they're not in a, they're not the U.S. military. They don't don't have this, uh, you know, how, how do you call it? Um, esprit de corps, right? The the spirit. Yeah. They yeah. don't have the values, right? They are fighting for God knows what, for some crazy propaganda, uh, which they simply, you know, is dumped in their heads. Uh, behind them are corrupt generals who have been stealing from their own army for years. I mean, wow. look, they were having issued the MREs, right? The, the meals they were yeah. issued were, uh, I think, uh, 2015 was the year they were supposed to be discarded. And we're in 2022, right? So they're Can you imagine that? They expired for seven years. And they, that, that's what the soldiers sent into the fray directly, right, into combat, were issued. Right? Wow. Can you imagine what, what's the attitude of the officers doing something like that to their own yeah. soldiers and to their own fellow, uh, fellow military guys, right? I can't imagine this happening in any normal military, right? even corrupt one. Right, because this is not about embezzlement or stealing money. This is about an attitude of one human being to another human yeah. being. If they hate each other so much, if they don't care about each other so much, why yeah. would you expect them not to to conduct the atrocities they are doing? I mean, they, they, they are pretty degraded by yeah. their life in Russia. The system Putin constructed is degrading human beings. Right? They are degraded. I mean, they are doing this to each other, not to their enemies, to each other. And I meant to ask you this also. I'm, I'm glad I remembered this before we wrap this show. Um, there was this a British volunteer that fought among the Ukrainian forces. Uh, goes by the name of Aiden that got captured by the Russian uh, forces. Um, and um, clearly, uh, a, a British citizen goes by the name of Graham Phillip, who went to, who actually obviously works for Putin, went to interview him. And I watched that interview, as many Ukrainians, many Americans here watched that interview. Um, how, how do you feel they're treating the Ukrainian POWs or the volunteers versus what, the way you guys are treating the POWs, the, the Russian POWs? So how, how, does this, how is this going so far? Look, the general mood is that you leave the last bullet for yourself, right? So no one in their right mind wants to become a POW of the Russians. Yeah. We've heard some pretty crazy stories, like really, really bad, 
really brutal, right? It's you'd you'd be lucky if they start showing you on TV, right? They then at least make you some kind of showcase, right? At least yeah. you won't be brutally murdered. Uh, a lot of people have suffered worse, so murders, tortures, really, really bad stuff, right? So you that's, you that's, don't want to fo- you don't. It, that's like place. you know that's like becoming a prisoner of Nazis, right? Something like that. Wow. And, so and how, uh, how, does, these lines. Mm-hmm. how does the Russian POWs that you guys have captured are being treated? Again, I'm pretty sure, you know, I'm not uh, trying to pretend that the Ukrainian army are saints. There might have been different stories, especially when the guys are captured near the front lines. But when they get processed into the system, it's uh, essentially according to Geneva Conventions. So they get interrogated by the... They, they're given over usually to the Ukrainian security service. They get interrogated. Then they, yeah. they get sent into prisons. They're actually kept in uh, regular prisons. Okay. So we didn't have any special camps for them and didn't, yeah. didn't have time to construct them. So they're being kept in regular prisons. You know, what's war is war. What's their uh, interaction? Like, what's their opinion? Once they're captured, what are they saying to you guys? Look, like, it depends. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always careful about, uh, you know, pretending that an opinion expressed by a POW on any side yeah. in any war is genuine. You know, yeah. you don't know what he genuinely thinks until he gets back yeah. from the war, gets back into normal shape, and then says yeah. something, right? I mean, these people are safe, they are fed normally, they are kept normally, and then they're exchanged for our prisoners, right? Which is a good thing. What are the uh, numbers in between your POWs in Russia versus their POWs in the Ukraine? Uh, do you feel the numbers are close to I even? think it's uh, about... A Several hundred to more than a thousand right now in Ukraine, but I don't have updated numbers, and they keep changing yeah. because they get exchanged, right? So more so than the last going on as the war. Yes, happens. yes. Also, like, my understanding is my reading of the situation is that the numbers of POWs have kind of decreased on both sides because uh, the less um, change ha- change of hands in territory, right? The more positional the war becomes, the less yeah. POWs you get, right? Because uh, both sides capture less people. So there were quite quite a lot of people captured when there was this fighting near Kiev, when the Russians were retreating, our guys were chasing them, they captured some of the units. Uh, now it's a bit less of it because the war is essentially positional right now. I mean, it's kind of a village or two taking, changing hands in the course of a day, right? It's less, uh, you know, less of massive movements. Wow. We thought we, this was amazing. Uh, how you feel, Tom, Absolutely. about I think that we were able to give these answers uh, to the people so they have access. They don't feel that they're stuck. They can't get any information. Um, Mr. Pablo, we, we can't thank you enough for taking the time. Thank you for me. having me. Thank you. And, and thank, it, you and it, thank you for doing what you're doing. It's a very right thing to do in these circumstances. And, and absolutely. And, you know, it's, I feel it's like our, our duty to, to support you guys. And, and, and I, I pray daily that you guys thank will. Thank you. We'll, we'll win this war by kicking them out of your land and, and get your freedom and democracy the way you want to. And, I, and I'm a huge believer that these are sovereign governments. These are nations that can decide what they want to do with their lives and with their destiny. And Putin has no right whatsoever to decide for them how they should live. I can't thank you enough, Mr. Pavlo, for, Pavlo, for coming from the Ukraine live in his own uniform uh, and bringing the truth to the American people that the truth they deserve to hear.